name is David Gardner. I'm executive director of the North Carolina Center for Health and Wellness at the University of North Carolina Asheville. I want to welcome you to the live stream of the keynote address from the National Physical Education Institute for Wednesday, July 30th. I hope you enjoy this keynote address. It is my privilege now to introduce Dr. Bob Pangrazy. And I honestly don't know Bob that well. Um, I know him professionally, but I, I'm, getting, I'm getting to learn more about him as a person. And he is a well-respected individual, nationally and internationally. And Bob, as Bob will explain, he's been it at a long time. He's been helping our profession gain more credibility, more professionalism. And with, uh, with the advent of high stakes accountability, I think all of us really need to heed Dr. Bob Pangracy's advice. So would you please give him a big welcoming, warm welcome, Dr. Bob Pangracy. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, one, I always open, if you've heard me before, I always open with the line, you know, when you're my age, it's a pleasure to be anywhere. And uh, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be with you. And yeah, I'll start by saying this is my 49th year in education. And, and thank you. And let me just preface a couple things to you so you know where I stand. I don't want you to have to guess what I believe, and I think by the time I'm done, you'll know exactly what I believe. I am a rip-roaring, card-carrying physical educator. I have done lots of things in my life. I've been a fifth grade teacher, a kindergarten teacher, PE teacher, professor for 35 years and a consultant for Gopher for 10 years. And nothing has changed about my love for physical education. I could have done something else in my life. I didn't have to go down this. But now looking back, if I had to do it all over again, I'd be right back where I am because I have loved this profession and the opportunity to do it. There's only one thing that's bothered me about it is I don't know what the hell physical education is. Because sometimes you don't know what it is. And we jump on one bag, bandwagon to the next. And we hear from a professional association, well, maybe you ought to try this. Maybe you ought to try that. And I'm going to tell you and look you in the eye and say to you very clearly, physical education is about physically educating kids with a heavy emphasis on education. It's not rolling out a ball. It's not a thousand games. It's not trying to make everybody happy. It's about teaching. And I was talking with a colleague last night and I said, you know, the greatest high stakes test for us that I want to see done in this profession is when kids leave school, they're given an exit interview and asked, what did you learn in PE? And I think oftentimes we're going to have a heck of a time finding an answer to that. What do you know well that you can use for the rest of your life? And I think we're going to have a hard time finding that. We have created a bunch of people who are jacks of all trades and masters of none. And when you're a master of nothing, then you do nothing. So I speak with passion. And I do that all the time anyway. But I speak with passion 
about the fact that physical education needs to know who they are and teach towards that end. And I'm going to try to show you why this morning and just talk about it. Let me just give you a brief history of where we've been. We started our profession in the States with the Swedish and German systems, centered on body development, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I want you to see if we're going back to these old things. You know, yesterday afternoon, I went to the Biltmore House, looked at their weight room. Some of the stuff they had in there looks just what we're using today, the ropes and pulleys and the dumbbells and little Pilates stuff. Okay, this is PE now, we're calling this all PE. So then we went to games and sports because in World War I, soldiers were getting flunked out and we got concerned and we wanted them to pass, so we said physical education will train them. And the military didn't know how to train, so they said we'll play sports and games. That has dogged us forever. We think we're sports and games. That's part of us. That's not who we are. Then all of a sudden in the 50s, when I was in high school, fitness testing came along and everybody said, oh my God, the Krauss-Weber test. Our kids couldn't even do one push-up, one sit-up. That was the fitness test, by the way, that they used in that research. And we said, American kids aren't nearly as fit as European kids. We've got to make this a fitness program. So you know what PE was? 100% fitness. Run the hell out of them, make them sick and then graduate them with a great love of P.E. Then in the 60s, we went to move education because there was a tremendous backlash to that fitness and said, we've got to think about kids. We've got to make it human. So now all of a sudden it was nice and it was sweet and it was good and let's do all these nice things. And people are starting to ask, who the hell are we? can't tell who we are. Well, that's okay. Maybe we've got it now. Maybe we've found ourselves. No! In the 70s, we came along to perceptual motor programs, and we said, you know, Kephart and Delicato came out with their books, not research-based, but they came out, they had an idea, and they said, you know, if you didn't crawl right when you were young, well, you couldn't read later. Sounds like a cock and bull story, and it was. There's no research to support that. But for years, P turned into all these balance beams and doing all these things and crawling and creeping and doing all those things. And we were all excited and said, ah, now we'll have a tie into academia. And that theme comes up over and over. If we can latch on to something else, we can be somebody. Now, I'm going to say it clear, because one thing about Bob is he doesn't stutter very often. The one thing we have to offer that nobody has is the development of the body. And yet we try to go different ways and tie to everything else but development of the body, the physicalness of who we are. And we want to run around that all the time. And then we say, yeah, but if we can improve academics, then they'll need us, then they'll want us, and then they'll sort, support PE. Now, friends, I'm older than most of you, but I've heard that song and dance and that shuck and jiving for a long time. Oh yeah, you attach on to something, you improve academics, we'll support PE. Well, take a look at it, are they? The answer is no, it hasn't worked. So then we went into conceptual learning, came out with the basic stuff series, said, you know, let's come up with some concepts. Now look, there are teachers out there all the time, working their tails off, doing great things, trying to do the right thing. But how do they know what the right thing is when we change every time we turn around? Every time your professional organization says, oh yeah, now nah, we gotta do this. And we move farther and farther and farther away from the development of who we are. And then, well, that's okay, now let's try health-related fitness. So we go into that in the late 80s.
then wellness and nutrition, the WIC Act, and we come in. We're all concerned about these highly obese kids because to tell you the truth, all this fitness, all this fitness testing, all this stuff we did hasn't made a darn bit of difference. We're fatter than ever. Do we not start to see the picture here pretty soon? How many times do we have to be hammered? Now I'm going to make it very clear to you. You're looking at a guy that absolutely loves physical fitness. I have trained this 71-year-old body as much as it'll take. And it takes less each year, unfortunately. <laughs> and when you're my age, I always say, you know, you guys go, I have a weight room in my house, and, you know, I lift all the time. People ask, why are you lifting? And I say, well, not to grow big and bulky, because that doesn't happen to me anymore, just to hang on to what the hell I have. But here we go again in 2000. Then we go comprehensive school health. Now let's change all these components of our program. And so we say, what is PE? And we ask the public. You ask the public. They ask you what you do. You say, I teach PE. And they say, what sport do you coach? I say, I don't coach sport. I teach PE. Oh, you must play lots of games. You must roll out the ball. Boy, that must be a nice job, must be an easy job. When there's nothing harder than being a great PE teacher. Nothing harder. You know, you're looking at a guy who has two uh, knee replacements because I wore them out. Your body aches all the time, those of you that have taught over 20 years. You gave your body up for your profession. It's tough. But nobody knows who we are. You know why? Because we don't know who we are. And we don't espouse who we are. And I'm going to try to take you down that path and tell you why we need to espouse who we are and what it should be. So just let me give you a quick background of kids. Because that impacts why I think activity has to be our accountability measure, our high stakes test measure. That's where I'm going with all this. Physical activity has to be what it is. If you don't graduate kids with a lifestyle of physical activity and wanting to be active every day and getting some exercise every day and seeing healthy eating as part of that package, then what have we done? So let's just look at kids. First of all, what you are as a as a person is so determined by your parents. So if you're good at athletics, you thank your mom and dad. If you're not good at athletics and you suck, well, so did your mom and dad probably. <laughs> you didn't go out, you don't take a couple of donkeys, take them out, breed them, and think you're going to win the Kentucky Derby with the offspring. How many athletes come from parents of great athletes? You know, I always said, if I had to do it all over again, and I knew then what I knew now, I would have looked for a woman who was a hell of an athlete and had some pretty athletic kids, except I would have screwed the whole thing up. So, so you know, here we are. Look at how much what you inherit genetically controls your physical performance. I want you to think about that as I talk about motor skills and about fitness. And by the way, I'm going to talk strongly in support of those two areas. But I'm going to talk in a way in which I say, that's not the accountability measure I want. Everybody responds differently. Let's talk about fitness and how kids respond to fitness. First of all, ele elementary school kids don't respond to fitness training. Now stop it. They don't. The evidence is clear. There are no hormones flowing. They don't respond. There's no muscle fiber differentiation. They don't respond to fitness training. Oh, yeah, you've bamboozled them, and I have too. You've tested them in the fall, and you've tested them in the spring, and you said, aha, they improved. 
Well, let me ask you a question. If you measure their height in the fall, you know where I'm going, huh? And you measure their height in the spring, and you say, aha, that shows you what a damn good PE program will do for you, you'll grow. And it's not about the kid, it's about my program. That's what we've been doing with fitness forever. Now I'm going to say it again, and you listen carefully. Do not walk out of this thing saying, I'm opposed to fitness. Do not walk out of this thing saying, I'm opposed to motor skills, because oftentimes you walk out of here, and if you think I said something, and it supports what you want to believe, then you say, yeah, Pangrazy said it. You know how many times I've heard something that Pangrazy said that I have no idea I ever said anything like that? I love fitness. I love skill development, and they have to be a critical part of our programs. But everybody responds differently. I mean, let's look at these males here, 28 to 35 years old. Same training program, adjusted them statistically so we could watch their change. Look at the unbelievableness of it. Some men didn't change at all. Some increased their VO2 max a liter. I mean, my God, these were all trained the same way. How discouraging for this group down here. They did the same program. They busted their tails trying to get it going and to improve, and look what happened, nothing. And that happens all the time. Here's something I want you to know because most people in our profession don't know it. This study came out in 2010. They have genetically mapped and found the genome that controls your ability to respond to training. One out of five adults do, does not respond to physical training. One out of five does not respond to training. One out of five doesn't respond to training no matter how hard you work them. They don't even get the blood lipid changes. And we've got to be sensitive enough to know that that same thing happens with kids. And here's the problem. I'm looking out at an audience of responders. Why do you think you went into this business? Because you trained and you improved and you thought you were studly. And you thought, wow, you know, I'm really something. And the kid next to you who went out and trained with you didn't improve at all and said, I'm not doing this. I'm going to go be a superintendent. <laughs> and I'll get even with that sucker sooner or later. <laughs> so know what we're working with. Understand the little one. You know, I'm a guy about kids. I've, I've written a little curriculum in my life. I know a lot about curriculum. I know it inside and out. Uh, you take all that and, you know, you give me all this evidence-based stuff and blah, 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 blah. When you boil it down, it's about kids. That's where your focus has to be. It's about little ones. Well, what about motor skills in these little people? Well, first of all, they come to you top-heavy. They have huge heads, short legs, short trunk. So, you know, everything is off balance. They throw, they fall. Everything, short levers, not who they're going to be. And by the way, strength in relationship to body size is the single most important factor, far and away, in kids being able to learn motor skills. So if you want to look, and you all know it, if you want to look at who's the best athlete in elementary school, it's that little tiny skinny kid with no fat on his bones, Quick, best runner, good at everything, gymnastic skills. That's the kid that does it because he has the highest strength in relationship to body size. Fat Freddy, you know what the problem is. Strength in relationship to body size goes down. And that kid then, the overweight kid who I love and who I've done a great deal of research on, overweight kids, and worked with them personally for years now, they suffer through all this. 
So you got this motor skill thing, all right? And then you have maturity. And you always think kids are the same when they come into a third grade, and this is an eight-year-old class. But 30 years ago, I did x-rays, skeletal x-rays on kids to find out their actual age, their skeletal age. Chronologically, they were all eight years old, but when you looked at their skeletal development, which is a true indicator of maturity, some were as young as five and some were as old as 11. Now, do you think the 11-year-old has an advantage over the five-year-old? Well, of course, common sense tells you that. But how many teachers look out and see eight years old and say, now, we've got this standard and you're all going to meet it? As little as three months difference in maturity makes a significant difference in skill performance and fitness performance. And you all know there's a huge age range in any grade, from kids who just turned eight to kids who are nine. Now you get into puberty, because I'm just giving you a quick snapshot, because I want you to go back and apply this. But now you get into puberty, and you got all the issues. But now physical differences become much more of an issue. And by the way, if you know, I've, when I lecture curriculum, I talk about when in elementary kids, they start the same in kindergarten, they can all do the same. They're all happy, happy. You know, they run around like loonies and they're happy and good. And then they start to differentiate and they start to see, wow, by third or fourth grade, you know, somebody is better than me. Maybe I'm not as good as somebody else. And then they get to middle school, and those differences are even greater. And now those middle school teachers sometimes forget that these are the reteaching years, and they say, well, what the hell did those elementary teachers teach you guys? You don't know a damn thing. Well, yes, they did teach them a lot. You know, I mean, if we really want to talk teaching, well, I won't go there, but I'll tell you which level teaches the most most of the time. And I'll just leave it at that. But they did a lot of teaching, but those guys have a new body. A brand new body you get in adolescence. The center of gravity is lowered, arm length, levers are all proportioned differently, muscle fiber differentiation occurs. So, and some students now realize that they might be responders because they went into adolescence, but remember some are still little people who haven't even entered puberty yet. And some have been in it for two or three years. And you're putting all these kids in the same room and saying, yeah, but let's meet the same standard. Are you getting this reoccurring thing? Let's meet the same standard. We don't care who you are, you just meet the same standard, please. We'll bring you all up to the same level. That hurts my heart. That turns off the people I want to turn on. I don't care too much when I teach PE about the great athletes in my class. I love them. And my saying is always, nobody's special in here. You're all special. But the ones I care about are those kids that don't have the skills. And those are the kids that I will give my heart and soul to to get them some success in their own little way and find something in which they can feel good about. Because everybody loves the athlete. Everybody wants your body. There's a million opportunities. So you get into that middle school area and your body needs to relearn all those skills. And that's why middle school teachers sometimes say, what the heck did you learn in elementary school? Well, I learned a lot, but I got a new body. Did you ever think of that, teach? <laughs> and now all of a sudden, look at all the things that happen. Look at all the things that go through that. And skills they could perform well, now they can't. And by the way, when you're in elementary school, there's no muscle fiber differentiation, so a little trick you probably know, but if you want to find out who your best distance runner is in your class, have them run a 30-yard dash. Whoever wins the 30-yard dash will be the best distance runner as well. You go try it out. Now you get into junior high and you have muscle fiber differentiation. Whoops, new body. 
And so now this kid who was a good sprinter probably isn't a good distance runner because of muscle fiber differentiation. So tremendously new body and they need to be learned. So what am I saying to you? I want motor skills taught. I want fitness taught. It needs to be in there, but it also needs to be adjusted so the kids feel good about it. So what should we be held accountable for in our profession? Because until we're held accountable for something, Well, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Let's talk about this. What should PE do? Okay, well, let's look at the NASPY outcomes. That's a brilliant body that sat together, did some great things. And, you know, every time they revise them, it comes out the same. You know, they reduce it number by one, but it comes out the same. Well, that's a funny thing. You know, and I just highlighted these because I'm making that point today. But motor skill development, physical activity and fitness, physically active lifestyle. Oh, but we want to be cool. Oh, we want to be cool. That's, that's not cool enough. That just says outcomes. So we want to be physically literate. And if I can say physically literate, now that sounds a hell of a lot better. But it says the same thing. thing. So fine, let's be physically literate. Let's be fit, let's be active, let's learn skills, let's value physically active lifestyle. Do you get the idea that I sort of think you've played with words and hung on words and wanted to be cool and use the right words and use physically literate and everything else, but what has it got you? Nobody knows who you are. Nobody knows what you're doing. Because about the time you learn what physically literate is, somebody's going to come back and say, whoa, no, you can't have that physical literate. We've got to have something else. So who are we? Well, you've got to have motor skills in a PE program. I'm going to say to you, and here's where I'm going from this point forward, I'm going to say to you that PE has to have a foundation, and it has to be a consistent foundation over time. And it has to be teaching motor skills, because skills are the tools that a large share of adults use for their movement possibilities. That's what they use to be active. It has to have motor skills, so I say teach them. But I say, you can't evaluate them, and you can't be held accountable for motor skills. Don't fool me. I've seen you teach throwing. You say, you know, pick an apple. You say, step toward the target. Then you say, rotate those trunks. And then you say, I'm going to design a rubric, and I'm going to evaluate that. And you're going to say, yeah, one, apple, two, three. Oh, great throw. And then the kid goes out and does this, and you say, boy, that's a hell of a throw as he pounds it into the ground. We're playing games. That's not how you learn to throw. Anybody knows anything about throwing, you give them a ball and say, throw it as hard and as far as you can. You can only learn complex sports skills by performing them at opt optimum speed, which is all out. How often do we say to kids, throw it as hard as you can? We don't give them the opportunity to learn those skills. But we've got to start. But we also have to be realistic. And you guys have worked on throwing for years, and you know what? 60% of your kids leave not being good throwers, no matter how hard you try. And you can sit here and tell me that they do, but that's a crock. I've been around kids my entire life. You can't make everybody a 90-mile-an-hour fastball thrower any more than anybody can, any art teacher can make a great artist out of someone. You can help them. You can show them the fundamentals. You can give them the confidence to say that's who you are because part of life is learning to know who you are and not trying to be something you aren't. But let's be honest. 
And so you say, well, you know, we're going to evaluate and hold ourselves accountable for mortar skills. Prove it. Never seen it done yet. And you know what the problem is? Even if you design the best rubric in the world, you're still not going to make great throwers out of some kids. So no matter how hard you try, how well you teach, how well you do things, you're never going to reach that as much as you want to. Now, having said that then, why would you want to hold yourself accountable for motor skill performance? Why would you want to make that a high stakes test and say, yeah, Mr. Superintendent, you go ahead and if I do well and all my kids do well as throwers and they all leave great throwers, then you'll support PE, and if they don't, they won't. None of you are willing to do that because you know you can't do it. And yet we've tried to hold that out there. So I say teach motor skills, but don't use them as an accountability measure. Teach them, though. Teach, teach, and teach. I'm a teacher at heart. I hate when I see my profession reduced to games and activities. I just can be honest with you, I hate it. For many teachers, it's about what new game do I have to try this time? Well, I just went to a workshop, I saw five new games, so I'm good for the next five weeks. And then you're going to call that physical education. Well, sorry, I love my profession and you're destroying it. We don't have any tests that are any good to measure skills. And by the way, when you take a lot of time for measurement, be it fitness, be it skills, what are kids learning? And you have so little time as it is with kids. So little time with kids as it is, and if you use six weeks for measuring fitness, and you use another three, four, five weeks for measuring skills, and going through your rubrics and your checklist and all those things, you've just taken time away from learning, and you don't have any time anyway. And we gotta start speaking up. You know, I hear these people say, it's data. Data will change the whole profession. We've had data forever. I spent my life, I've published 120 research articles with d data. I've written 75 textbooks filled with all kinds of information. I know data till it comes out my friggin' ears. We've got enough information. We know. And you ask teachers who are out there on the firing line every day, and they'll shake their head, yes, we don't have enough time. We can't take time to do that. All right, well, what about fitness? You just heard me. I just said, do motor skills. Now I'm saying, do physical fitness. I love it. Any of you that know my curriculum know that the one thing that hasn't changed, and my books and texts have changed tremendously over the years, but from the very first edition, I just finished the 18th edition, and from the very first edition on, it always had a fitness component. It always had a skill development component, and it still does. It still does. What about fitness? It's not about that product. That fitness score isn't worth all that much. Should you physically te fitness test kids? Sure, I don't mind. I think we way overdo it. And I think kids should learn to test themselves, not have somebody do it to them. And then I ask teachers, even PE teachers, how many of them go out and run the mile or do the pacer until they're sick and can't run anymore and I don't give them any hands. And they say, well, gee, that's something that at least our profession ought to do for the rest of their life because we use six weeks a year, one-sixth of the curriculum, to talk about fitness, and now not even my professional friends are using it. Wow, you want to waste all that time? Teach kids how to do it to themselves. Enable the kid. 
And fitness grams moving in that direction, and I love it. I do a lot with pedometers and physical activity, and we're uploading that stuff to phones. So it's the kids' data. Your fitness data is your data. Because you know what? I haven't seen teachers do much when they get the data and look at it. Some kids pass, some kids don't. Some kids are in the healthy fitness zone, some aren't. And then you go in there and revamp your whole program so to try to help, you know, remedy that. But I haven't seen much of that where I live, but maybe I live in the wrong place. But fitness needs to be a part of every lesson. I'll never sway from that because you need to learn what fitness feels like. You need to learn what it takes to be fit. You need to learn the lifestyle of fitness. That's the part I want you to learn about fitness. And I think that's terribly important. And by the way, you know, in fitness, my love, the favorite, my, one of my favorite exercises is push-ups. And yet you all know when you say to a fourth or fifth grade, let's do some push-ups, what do you hear from them? You wonder, you wanna know why? I'll tell you why. Because you get them as first graders, and those little knotheads have a huge head. It's 90% of adult size. Their legs are 30% of adult size. Their trunk's about 40% of adult size. And you put them down here in that push-up position, you say, give me a push-up. And they give you, you know, this old butt sway. Because they know if they bend their arms with that heavy head, hell, they're going down. <laughs> And then they try. If you had a head that size, you couldn't do push-ups. <laughs> and they can't do them. So you know what they say to themselves? I hate these things, because what do you say when you can't do something? You avoid it and say you hate that stuff. Now you lay them on their back and say, give me a sit-up. And those little short legs pop straight up in the air and the head stays on the ground. And they fail, and they say, I hate these things. And they say, yeah, but we're doing them in first grade, and we're doing them in second grade, and we're doing them in third grade, and if you try really hard, you'll be able to do a lot. And it's a crock. I love push-ups. I do 150 push-ups a day. And if I asked a lot of you to give me 150 push-ups, you'd bitch and moan too. <laughs> and yet we turn it around and ask these kids to give it to us. And it's one of the greatest exercises that we've ever designed. It gives you the abdominal strength, the leg strength, it gives you that nice trunk, keeps everything where you want it. I'm a fitness guy, but you don't start kids with failure and you don't lie to them and tell them if you try hard, you'll be able to do them. With a body like that, how in the hell are they going to be able to do them? They can't. So I want you to teach physical fitness, but not as an accountability measure. Every time we talk about accountability, we say skills, we say fitness scores. God, ask somebody, well, what do you have for accountability in your program? Oh, fitness. Well, it's so genetically controlled, and little kids don't respond to training. And you're probably not going to get kids to respond to training until they get into high school, because the middle school is so clouded up with all different developmental levels. So fitness and skill development, it takes time. And you know what? Just read that. I don't care how good a teacher you are. If you're never going to improve the fitness and bring kids to a high level of skill when you meet them twice a week, you have 30 minutes and we say, you know, if you have a great lesson, it's got 15 minutes of activity in it. So you get that twice a week and you're telling me, boy, I'm making a hell of a difference. Who are you kidding? Let's be honest. We can't do our job anymore in the gym and have to expect to have any outcomes. It's going to have to be done outside. But I don't care how good a teacher you are, myself included, it's not going to happen with that kind of time. And here's the problem, Ben. Now we get the narrowing of the curriculum. We don't have a standardized test. We want to put fitness in there. We want to put skill development in there. But 
This is the filter, the accountability standardized test filter. This is math and reading. They get all the money. Now science is up there too. They get all the money. Down here where we don't have anything for which we can show accountability, and that's the arts and that's PE, we don't get any money. I mean, you know, it's just wonderful how much schools spend on PE. Yeah, we'll give you kids maybe twice a week, maybe once a week, put you on a six-day schedule, you know, and say, that's PE, now you show us some results. Who are you kidding? I'm tired of being a nice guy. I want more. Not, I'm, I'm, to my last breath, not settling for that. But the test we've used, fitness and skills, will never be a high stakes test because those kids won't be able to reach it because they're so genetically limited, many of them. So they'll never get above this line where we can show some results. So what's the answer? This has to become our high stakes outcome, physical activity. We have such great tools to measure physical activity now. And I know I work for Gopher, so let me give a disclaimer. Yes, I design pedometers. Yes, I help design software for pedometers. I just do that, and other companies make good pedometers, and I'll say it to my colleagues up there, so I'll just be as open as I can about that and give you that disclaimer. But if you don't measure it, it doesn't mean anything. And activity is the one outcome we now can measure with pedometers that are highly accurate. By the way, the validity of pedometers is up around 0.9. The validity of a fitness test battery, probably the best one we have, is around 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And I won't even interpret what that means to you in terms of percentages, but I'll just tell you, that's not all that accurate. It doesn't validly measure what it purports to measure very often, but pedometers do. Here's the reason activity is, has to be our outcome measure. It's not genetically limited, and every kid can increase their activity. Every kid. Fat Freddy, who I love, even he has a chance to improve. And you have a way to measure it accurately. And we now have a high stakes measure when we say at the end of their career, how much activity did you accumulate? Did you increase your activity over time? You've got so many things to share with these people about what they did and they can improve. And then when they leave, if they would leave with a lifestyle of knowing how to he eat healthy and be active every day, what more could you give them? What a legacy to leave kids. It would be absolutely the most beautiful thing you could leave your young people. And we would be a profession like no other, like no other. We would be valued. When you look at activity and academic performance, most of you have seen this. This came out in 2010. These are correlation studies. It's not cause and effect. But then, just recently, last month, CDC re released another one, and now we have cause and effect studies, pardon me, that show that Active students have better grades, and these are cause and effect studies. That time spent in recess, got to have recess, impacts classroom learning and behavior. And activity breaks in the classroom helps. So what's the message there? We got to get involved in those things. We've got to change our mold of saying, I'm going down in the old box, I'm teaching my seven periods today, and then I'm done. You can't be done because your job only starts 
If you don't change behavior outside of PE, you haven't done anything because I just got done showing you that you only get PE a small amount of time and you can't change it. If you don't think physical activity makes a dent on the obesity issue, take a look at this. These are kids from three countries, the US, Sweden, and Australia. We publish this in Medicine and Science and Sports, but we gather data on kids and, and then divide them into turtiles, least active, more active, most active. When you look at it, it's clear to you when you look at the total sample of girls that America is winning the, fight, the fat race. We are the fattest developed country far and away. You look at Sweden, half of it. Australia, even less. Now, if you don't think activity makes a difference, look at the percentage of overweight kids in the least active group versus the most active group. Activity has a huge impact on the obesity problem. It is the problem. Obesity, inactivity, and sedentary behavior, not getting kids out of their seats. And you've heard people talk about getting out of their seats. Stand up a second, please. Too slow, sit back down, please. One of the things we learn as adults is to move slowly. So the models for little people look like this. Walk slowly. Okay, let's get down in all fours. Uh, uh. That's a learned behavior. It's a learned behavior. We're their models. We tell them to slow down all the time. Life is about moving and getting there. Where in the hell are you going? I don't know, but get there. <laughs> let's see how quickly you can stand. Now, I love that. Then I say, man, this is the best group I had all day. I love this group. And when you get your kids to move like that, you say, I love these kids. Then you teach like a winner. And when you let them dog it around, and the least cooperative, slowest moving kid controls your class. And we always turn control over to that kid. We stand around waiting for that knucklehead. All right, here's what we're going to do in place. Give me six. Nice knee lifts. That away. All right, now you're going to play me in rock, paper, scissors. We're going to go one, two, three, four, five, and on the sixth, you're going to give me rock, paper, or scissors and see if you can score a point against me. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six. Now you got it. Here we go. That was only a practice. You didn't get a point for that one. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, here we go. If it's a push, you got nothing. Five. All right, here we go. Now I'm going to delay this next one. All right, have a seat. Too slow. I'll back up, back up. You forgot already. You forgot already, because you have the slow habit. All right, have a seat. My point, going back to this data, is activity makes a difference on the health of kids. We've got to ultimately take responsibility for the health of kids. We can't pass that on to anybody else or we're nobody. We need to take responsibility for that. When you look at boys, it's exactly the same. Now, people ask me, because I lived in these three countries and, and helped gather the data, people ask me, why is it that America is so darn fat and Australia and Sweden look so good? And I said, well, in Sweden, after every 45 minutes of academic work, they get 15-minute break. How about that? In Australia, 
They all have to belong to an after-school club, an activity club run by the school. The school takes control of it. Nowadays, PE say, no, I'm turning up my nose at that. We're farming it out. I, I'm done. But in Australia, they run that. And then on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock, close down the school, and away you go. So it does make a difference when you give kids free time. And by the way, there's absolutely no research at all to show that when you take some of that time for activity that you take away from academic performance. You can't find me any evidence that says that. In fact, if you think about it logically for a second, we are probably the only profession who can honestly say, and we have good research now, I just showed it to you, we're probably the only profession that can say, through increased activity, brain bakes, recess, lunch hour activities, where we get involved and intervene, we can make a huge difference on academic performance. Right now, the only way we know to improve academic performance in the schools, the only evidence we have, is through physical activity, friends. Oh, they've tried all kinds of things in the schools. Longer school days, no recess, six days a week. And you watch those guys, they circle around, they're almost as bad as PE. And they try this scheme and that scheme and every other scheme. The only area where there's good hard research for improving academic performance, physical activity. Now, why wouldn't you want to be the physical activity instrument in your school, what we call the physical activity champion? Somebody has to champion that cause or it doesn't happen. Where do kids get their activity? Not in PE. You don't have them enough. I'm not criticizing you. You're doing the very best you can with what you have. They just gave you nothing and said, be highly successful. But let's be honest, and maybe we have to change our influence outside. So I think that PE is the champion of the champions. That's where it has to start. We've got to have strong PE programs, and that PE teacher has to be the strongest advocate of physical activity. And it has to occur outside the school environment. You have to change their behaviors outside of school. Trying to do it all in PE is a joke. It's not going to happen. And I'm an advocate for saying, let's change the role of the PE teacher. Get them the hell out of the gym and quit giving them release time for classroom teachers. That's the only reason they want you there. And let's start taking those people and doing it like a school nurse. Okay? Let's let you work with overweight kids individually. Let's let you go out and promote activity in the community. Let's have you go out and work the, the playground. Because all a playground is is a jungle where the strong dominate the weak and bully the lessers. And stand on the side and watch and have no equipment. Only 30% of kids are active at recess. You, if, go, if you go out there and intervene in it by zoning it and putting out equipment, you can get that up to 80, 85%. You've got to help kids develop active lifestyles. And one of my favorite ones is this. We've got to get over force in our profession because when you force people to do things, you lower their intrinsic motivation. If you force someone to do something, when you're no longer around their motivation to do that thing, they got forced, plummets. You take away their intrinsic motivation. Force is not the answer. Encouragement, love, hugs, talking, working with them. That's the issue, but force doesn't work. And you ever think about, you know, our heritage, Take them out, force them, you know, let's give me the daily dozen and run a mile. You know, and Fat Freddy comes dogging in every time last. And then we say, well, how come you don't like PE, Fat Freddy? Well, if we can't figure that out, we got trouble. 
teach them great, healthy school behaviors, promote family activities. You know these things, but do it. You know these things. There's a million, the Alliance for a Healthy Generation. I could go on and on. There's so many places out there helping you. We just need to do it, but we got to get out of the box. Can't be in there anymore. And we have to teach people that all activity counts. I hate when people think one type of activity is better than another. So I'm walking down the street and I'm walking faster than someone and I say, wow, they're sure losers, they walk slow. And about that time, a jogger comes by me and looks at me and says, well, you know, pick it up, man. And then here comes a guy who's really a sprinter and he does a marathon, you know, at five minute mile clip. And he said, you know, you're all losers. All activity is good activity. In fact, my saying is just move that thing. Just get it going. When in doubt, move it. And then challenge them with things they can reach. And give them autonomy over their workloads. Let them decide. And remember that human beings don't feel the same every day. Did you know that some days you feel like doing more than others? That's life. Some days you feel stronger than others. Some days you don't feel as strong. That's life. That's the ebb and flow of life. And so you've got to be in tune with that. When I was teaching middle school, I always gave my middle school kids five days where if they didn't want to participate because they were tired or whatever, they could take them up. Now, some knuckleheads used all five at the start, and they never got another one. But they soon learned after a while that, you know, if you really didn't feel good that day, you could take it off. You ever take a day off? I have a hunch some of you have been taking too many days off. <laughs> All right. So just let me say this to you. Our lives begin to end when we stop speaking about things that matter. I'll say it, and I'll say it, and I'll say it. And people who really know me know that I always say, you'll never take away the spirit and the drive I have and the love for my profession, no matter what you do to me. I'll believe in it, but I'll look at it in a way that might be different than how you look at it. And I'll think outside of it and think, what can I do to be successful and make this a great profession? and change it. And I absolutely love what I do. I love my profession. I love teachers. And I'll close by saying, I can't thank you enough for being teachers and changing the lives of our young people and making young people better than they ever thought they could be because the only thing that matters and a teacher that really counts is one who makes you believe and perform better than you thought you could. That's a teacher, not a teacher that entertains you, not a teacher that makes you happy, but a teacher that pulls you to a level that you didn't think you could reach. Years ago, I read an article by Sidney Harris called Authentic Teaching, and he said, great teachers often just scare the hell out of you. They challenge you, they push you to be more than you thought you could be. You all, will probably say to yourself, I'm doing the best I can. How the hell do you know that? You can always do better. Go out, change the world. A NASPE person asked me the other day, do you think it's ever gonna change and PE is gonna get better? And I said, you know, I never, add, I never look at that question, ever. You know, gee, Bob, I get this question often, gee, Bob, you've been in PE 50 years. You think things are ever going to get better and we're going to get supported? And I say, I never look at that question. I don't even worry about that question. That's such a damn big question that I have no clue. All I do is I work every day to the best of my ability to be the best I can, to speak as strongly as I can about things I want and teach with the highest level of professionalism. That's what I can do. I can't change the world, but I sure can change me.
And so thank you for being who you are. I appreciate and love you all. Thanks for letting me speak with you.